Let's start off taking a look at a couple of problems. Remember the way that we want to think about the cross product. The cross product is going to be a vector perpendicular to the two factors. So I cross J is going to be a vector that's perpendicular to I and perpendicular to J. Anyone know what vector that's going to be in this case? Okay, this one's easy to spot. It's I cross J. We know that this is going to be K because K is perpendicular to I and J. So we can see that this is equal to K since K is perpendicular to I and J. The other possibility, the other possibility is minus K. So we could, could, we might want to confirm this by actually doing this calculation. Remember that the cross product tells us, uh, gives us a vector that's perpendicular to the two vectors. But if we have two non-collinear vectors, that is, if we have a plane, there are, are two directions that we can be that we can draw <laughs> perpendicular to that plane, one going up and one going down. So we might want to uh, confirm this that that we're going to get k and not minus k. We know that if I cross J is equal to K, then J cross I will be negative K. So we get lots of information based on that confirmation anyway. So then we're going to have this vector K and then this vector I plus J. So I plus J, we're going to, have to think about what, vec uh, what that vector is. What is that telling us? And then what happens if we do a cross product of that with K? Any questions before we get started? So the vectors that we have in play are i, which is 1, 0, 0, and j, which is 0, 1, 0. If we want to do i cross j, we're going to calculate a determinant. of this three by three matrix. We did this last week by cofactor expansion. So let's just do cofactor expansion. There's a lot of zeros running around, so we're not really intimidated by the cofactor expansion here. Let's find out what happens. So our I cofactor is zero, zero, one, zero by rows. Minus the J cofactor is one, zero, zero, zero. And the K cofactor is one, zero, zero, one. That's just an identity matrix. It's, it's equal to its own transpose. So one, zero, zero, one by rows or by column. Yes. No, because those are the, those are the, the, the standard I, J, and K. That, those, that's the, uh, standard basis for R3. So notice that for I and J, since we have a zero row for I and a zero column for J, those are both going to zero out. So when we multiply all these things out, we get zero I minus zero J plus one K, just as we had suspected. Very emperor moment, just as we had foreseen. Emperor is always like, oh, it's just as I had foreseen. So in my version of Return of the Jedi, when Vader like grabs the emperor and hucks him down into the hole, I saw this coming. <laughs> Yeah, in uh, cofactor expansion, um, 
you always alternate signs. So if you start up here in the first row, first column, that's positive, then negative, then positive. So that's just part of the cofactor expansion. All right, now let's think about what we got here. I plus J cross K, that's what we're actually calculating here. So if we think about I plus J, that's going to be um, the vector one, one, zero. So we want the cross product of one, one, zero and the vector zero, zero, one. So we think about a vector going at 45 degrees and um, we think about a vector Everything is telling me not to draw this, so I think I need to draw it. So the vectors that we have running around, we have I, which is going along the X axis, and J in the Y axis. So it makes sense that K is the cross product of I and J. So here's I and here's J. Then the cross product of those two vectors is K. The Z axis is perpendicular to the X axis and the Y axis, no surprises here. Perpendicular, perpendicular. Now, if we draw the vector i plus j, the vector i plus j is going to be in the xy plane. That's the first vector in our the cross product in the problem, I plus J. So I plus J is just gonna be the vector one, one, zero. So if we think about the cross product of I plus J cross I cross J, so I plus J cross K, I'm gonna find a vector that's perpendicular to I plus J and perpendicular to K. So if we imagine the plane containing the Z axis at a 45 degree angle along this I plus J, we're gonna find a cross product that's gonna be perpendicular. So we should expect to find something 45 degree, let's see, we're going I cross J, bend it up towards K since I plus J is listed first. So we're gonna expect it to go this way it looks like it's going to be in the XY plane, but at a 45 degree angle to compensate for this 45 degrees that we moved, the, that we twisted the I plus J. So we're expecting something in the XY plane. So no, we're expecting zero in the K and it should be maybe uh, I minus J. So that's, that might be our initial guess. We're gonna calculate and find out, but I like to guess first and then calculate. So we're expecting something perpendicular to I plus J and K. That's gonna put something in the XY plane because it needs to be perpendicular to K. So I plus J cross K in XY plane. because it has to be perpendicular to K. So if I just draw a vector in the XY plane, that's also perpendicular to I plus J, we are suspect. Oops. Because we're still going in the, if I draw it perpendicular, I'm still going in the positive x direction, but I'll go in the negative y direction. 
and that'll give us perpendicular there. Let's find out. We can just calculate this, but we should always try to guess what our, our result is going to be because we should always be checking our intuition. So I'm going to take I plus J, which is Now, if we think about the mechanics, if we think about the mechanics and compare that to our, uh, our guess, our suspicion, we can see that our suspicion is going to work out because I's cofactor is the identity matrix. J's cofactor is the identity matrix. There. But K's cofactor has that zero row. So we're going to get zero in front of the K. So already our suspicion is looking good. I have to drop down to clear this. So our I is going to be 1, 0, 0, 1. Our J cofactor will be 1, 0, 0, 1. Subtracting because we're doing cofactor expansion. And our K cofactor will have that row of zeros. So we'll get 1I minus 1J plus 0K. This problem was not about the calculations. It's a problem that you can solve just by calculating stuff. But the idea is that we think about what our calculation is going to tell us to see if our calculation, may, if, our, if our intuition is working. You always want to see where your intuition is at when it comes to your calculation. Any questions? But you all, if the calculations are available, you should always check your calculations. your calculations versus your intuition. An important message to our boomer listeners who think that you could just stop buying coffee and then suddenly afford rent. All right. So we had another problem, a request from homework 13. Uh, section three, the dot product section, where we wanted to we have a bunch of vectors. A is 3j plus k. C is i plus 8j. Y is 5i minus 8j. And Z is I minus 5J minus K. Uh, and the task is to just calculate A dot Y times C dot Z. Hopefully I copied those down right. So one thing to note about this problem is notice that we've got a couple of kinds of multiplication involved in this problem. A dot Y, that's a dot product. We are multiplying two vectors. We want the scalar product of those two vectors. And then we have the scalar product of C dot Z. C dot Z, that's once again, the dot product of vectors. When you calculate the dot product, you get a scalar. That's why I have no symbol in between the sets of parentheses between the two dot products, because we have a scalar. This is a scalar. 
and C dot Z is another scalar. And so the multiplication that goes in between is just regular multiplication. Because we're just going to be multiplying a couple of real numbers. Then it's just a matter of keeping track of where the zero is. I almost put this problem on the homework, mostly so I could make the point that this is a scalar times another scalar, which is why there's no symbol in between. It wouldn't make sense to put a dot there because dot is for the dot product. That's for multiplying vectors, but the dot product results in a scalar. So this is scalar times scalar. The other thing that we have to keep track of here though, is that the vectors are listed with this i, j, and k, which means we don't have the zeros in our vectors. So the vector A is 3j plus k. If we list all the components, it's 0i, 3j, 1k. And the vector y is 5i minus 8j. If we take out, since there's no k, we write this as 5, negative 8, 0 k. So we want to make sure that we get uh, multiply the correct things. When we find the dot product, we just want to find the sum of the products of the corresponding components. We're going to have to make sure that we know where those zeros all are. So a dot y. Is going to be zero times five plus three times negative eight plus one times zero or negative 24. Then, of course, we'll need to do the same thing for C uh, and Z, but Z has all three components, so it's hard to miss there. But C only has two components. 1i, 8j, and 0k. And then z, we can see all the components. So c dot z is going to be 1 times 1 plus 8 times negative 5 plus 0 times negative 1. So negative 41. And then, so the calculation that we need for the problem is just a dot y times c dot z, which is positive 24 times 41. Any questions? Eight hundred. So twenty. How much? Nine eighty-four. Thank you. Yeah, 984. Ever since I made the connection that algebra was just arithmetic, base x instead of base 10, I wanted to get better at multiplying numbers just by looking at things without setting up that stupid algorithm that I was programmed with, but it's really hard to get away from the stupid algorithm that you were programmed with. Yeah. 
might have. There, so you want you're going to want to track that down. I don't know if y'all are computer science majors, but if you're computer science, you're going to want to track that down because it might have been that you put a zero, like instead of C being one eight zero one zero eight, maybe you put the zero in the wrong place, or maybe you just said eight times five is thirteen or something weird like that. But sometimes our minds betray us that way. Yeah. All right. Psychic calculator, what is eight times five? And it's like all oh, 13. Yeah, all 13. Eight times negative five, yeah. Uh, one and negative 40. Oh, yeah, it's a positive one, isn't it? Now, minus 10 points for me. Yeah, because it'd be negative 40 plus one. Because the one I want is, oh, oh, man. Now I got this wrong. So 984, take off two 24s. So at 984, what's minus six, minus 24 is 960. Minus another 24 is 940. <laughs> Negative four. So was that nine thirty six? We all gotta redo it. <laughs> yeah, it's probably something like I just did. Uh, cleverly demonstrating how easy it is to make an arithmetic error, especially when you're me. I think the the mistake should be like your correction. So it's like minus 39 points for getting this part wrong, but then I get plus 936. So I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> How'd you get so high? I screwed up. Wait a second. Maybe, yeah. I was off by two, so I don't know. I think there's all kinds of grading systems. And the one that I've kind of landed on is whatever happened, you get zero, but you also get the opportunity to fix it because that's the whole point of making the mistake in the first place. So if I have a problem that's worth 10 points and you get zero, don't argue for partial credit, just redo it and get 10 points, get full credit. Um, so the way that, uh, that's a great question because I never really explain how the final exam works. A couple weeks before the, the last day of finals, uh, the final exam will be posted on Canvas and then I will let you know what my grading schedule is. So um, let's say I post it on a Friday and I'll say the first round of grading happens on Wednesday. Anything that you do before that went the following Wednesday, anything you do before I go through my first round of grading, uh, I'll score. And if you have questions, you can ask about them. And then you have an opportunity to fix it and then you can resubmit it again. And I'll say my next round of grading is on Friday. And then anything you fix between Wednesday and Friday, I'll grade that again. So you have a chance to, to get those points back. And then I'll let you know that my last round of grading will be on this Thursday. And so anything you submit on Thursday, um, I usually do my last round. I say my last round is midnight on Wednesday before Thursday where I actually grade it. So Thursday morning I get up, I go through the last round of grading, and then anything that you submit on Thursday is your final submission. Yeah, you just, I think it's just better that way. This way, it's an actual learning experience. Any questions? Yeah, you just do the, uh, you can just follow the uh, example and do the cross product. For the volume of the parallel the cross product dot the uh one of the vectors there's like a formula for it any questions on these problems the important thing to remember is that um the cross product is telling you about a vector perpendicular to the two vectors in the in the multiplication 
And the dot product is the product of the magnitudes of the vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. So when we look at this dot product of a dot y and got negative 24, we can tell that a, uh, a and y, the angle between them is greater than 90 degrees. How can I tell that the angle between a and y is greater than 90 degrees? If I was to sketch a, uh, a and y, how do I know that I need to draw an angle greater than 180 degrees? Or sorry, greater than 90 degrees. How did I know it's an obtuse angle between A and Y? Remember that the A dot Y is, we calculate A dot Y by finding the sum of the products of the corresponding component. But the other way we can calculate A dot Y, oh, we wouldn't be able to calculate it in this case. The other thing A dot Y tells us is that A dot Y, spelled A wrong, is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of Y times the cosine of the angle between A and Y. The, the sign's all just multiplication. In the cross product, we're calculating a determinant, and that's why we have the alternating signs. We're not calculating a determinant in the um, dot product. So the reason I know that a, dot, uh, a and Y have an obtuse angle in between them is that A dot Y is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of Y times the cosine of theta, the angle between the two vectors. And we know that this is a negative value. The magnitude of A is the length of A. That's necessarily positive. The magnitude of y is a magnitude, a length. So that's necessarily positive. So if I'm getting a negative value from this dot product, it must come from cosine of theta. That must be the negative one. Because our product was negative 24. So that tells us some stuff about A and Y when the dot product comes out negative. There's an obtuse angle in between them. If we think in terms of projection, the projection of Y onto A, since the angle between A and Y is greater than 90, it makes sense that the component of Y in the direction of A should be negative. Because we have a, 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 an obtuse angle between A and Y. So the component of Y in the direction of A will definitely be in the opposite direction of A. So that makes sense too. Good question? This seems like a lot to think about because it's a lot to think about. And you have to think about it all the time. Any questions? This is the annoying thing about doing math problems at this level. This problem was just to come up to come up with the 936. You could do this problem just by calculating a couple of dot products and multiplying those results and getting 936 and then just letting it go. Wiley plus says, correct, 936. But you want to look at all the stuff that's going on and think about what else is this telling me? A dot Y is negative. C dot Z is also negative. What does that mean for A and, A and Y? If I wanted a picture in my mind, A and Y, do I draw an acute angle between them or do I draw an obtuse angle between them? That's not a thought that's going to help us calculate 936, but it is a thought that's going to help us understand how the dot product. One of the reasons that this is an important thing to do is if we think back to integration, 
and our generic description of integration as multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. With this dot product, we have just introduced a kind of multiplication. So we should not be surprised that in chapter 18, I think it's chapter 18. In chapter 18, we talk about line integrals. The multiplication that shows up in a line integral is the dot product. We're going to integrate a dot product of a vector dot some other vector. And we're not going to be surprised by this or think that it's weird in any way because integration is just multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. Dot product is a multiplication. It's a candidate for integration. How's everybody okay? Yeah. It's just a lot to think about. Our next big thing. We're just going to get ourselves started on thinking about this, which we kind of already have started about thinking about. It. All right, let's think, let's get into our calculus mind. Start thinking about calculus mindset. The first big chunk of calculus, once we got through the describing things, what we mean by things like limits, what we mean by con continuous, we started talking about differentiability. And we start with the more complicated of the two ideas. What is the slope of the line tangent to a function at a given point? tangent to a curve at a given point. This is for when we're dealing with a curve defined by a function y equals f of x. So if we think about the discussion, which was do the calculus thinking, but for a surface, that's where we make our first upgrade. That's where we make our first change. We go from a curve y equals f of x to a surface z, equals f at x, y. We have a function of one variable. We're talking about what's going on at a given point, and that point is just a play of a value for x. And the decision based on incredibly poor, poor planning, instead of calling this x naught, so we can just translate it right into the equation of a line. So I like, oh, would just call it c. And it's like, I'll do later on. We're going to need two. I would just call it C. We can call it C and D. But we can't use D as a constant because D is like too common in all of our derivative notation. Then they're like, ah, it'll be fine. And it's just not. It's just not fine at all. It's like when we decided that pi was going to be 3.14 instead of 6.28. And we're like, oh, we should make uh, pi. This is going to be the uh, ratio of the uh, circumference to the diameter. It's like, oh, why don't we make that the radius since that's like kind of more definitive, defining characteristic of the circle. Like, oh, no, it'll be the diameter, 3.14, it'll be fine. 
later on, all these trigonomic, trigonometry classes later, it's not fine. So annoying. Full circle, two pi, half a circle, one pi. It could have been a full circle was one pi and a half circle, half pi. We could have had that. We could have had that. But they're like, oh, no, pi is a ratio of the circumference to the diameter. The diameter. I, if, if I could go back in time, I would go back and say, oh, no, use the radius. Use the radius. But then it'll be like 6.28. They didn't, it's not like they knew that. It'd be around six instead of around one. And I'd be like, oh, six is a better number anyway. Six is literally a perfect number. Did you know that? Six is a perfect number. Uh, because people can't read and they translate things. Oh, we're also worried about, we're also apparently assuming that everything is base 10 all the time, right? Because 666 does not mean the same thing. Like in The Simpsons, is 13 unlucky because of that number of objects or is it the representation of a one and a three? Right? Like what's unlucky? Is it the collection of that many objects, a dozen and one extra object? Is that what's unlucky? Or is there just a representation of a one and a three? Is that what's unlucky? Which one is it? If your answer is, it doesn't matter. If that's what your silence means, if your silence means it doesn't matter, it's just a superstition, then that's correct. But if you're going to be superstitious, you need to understand your superstition. Is it the collection of a dozen and one extra? Or is it the representation of a one and a three? because the one and the three is very specific to counting like this. The Simpsons would not look at a collection of 13 objects like you, like a dozen and one and say 13. They would not do that because they don't have this. They have this. You know what I'm talking about? So why would, why would we think they count base 10? So what if they count base eight? You know what I mean? They wouldn't look at a dozen and one and say 13. They would look at a dozen and one and say 15. Maybe 15 is unlucky if you're a Simpson, a Simpsons character. Do you know what I mean? There is one character on the Simpsons that has five fingers. Anybody know who it is? Anyone? So go back and think about this partial derivative business. Um, think about how slope changes, line changes, tangent is going to be the same. Think about what this given point is going to be and think about what we're going to have to have here. That's it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everyone have a good day. Find out who on The Simpsons has five fingers and thanks for playing.